Uh, welcome to the uh, GOMEX feature Features and Future Talk from the BioXS in Moscow 2020. For those of you that may not know me, may not know me, I am the GOMEX Development Manager at Salaf Live in Stockholm, where I'm responsible for organizing the general development of GOMEX that we are following our own guidelines that we are having and we are meeting the targets that we are having for providing new features for you. Also making sure that we release new versions, new updated versions of the code, patch releases and so on on time and that those have as few bugs as possible when you get, uh, get your hands on them. During this talk I will give you a very quick overview about some of special features of Gomex. This is, of course, far from complete because I don't have several hours of time to tell you about everything that Gomex can do. And you can always just go to the documentation to find out everything that is currently supported for the current version on, and also for previous releases. In the documentation, you will also find the release notes that tell you what exactly has changed between versions in the past. And you will also get some information what we are planning to do in the future, looking at uh, in-development documentation, and also finding out what features may have been removed because we decided we can no longer support them. If you want to know exactly what has happened in the few previous versions since 2018, I recommend that you check out the excellent uh, Bioxa webinar series for the different GOMAX releases. That will tell you in much more de detail and depth what has happened in the past, what was new in those different versions, and also what we are plan with what we are planning to continue doing. And you can check on us if we manage to actually do what we have been planning to do. I will start the talk actually not with talking about what the uh, code will do for you in terms of different MD uh, simulation settings or simulation modes, but talking about the uh, hardware acceleration that we are using to actually getting the performance out of Gromax that you are interested in. Hmm. In this figure that is quite busy, you can actually see one of the main things we are using to improve calculation speed. That is that we are not using the standard pair list that you have for the um, basically all our MD engines. See in the figure on the left, you have a standard pair list setup where every Atom will in interact with atoms around it, and you're making a list of atoms that may possibly interact with this atom and only calculate interactions with them. This is simply done to reduce the n squared um, scaling problem that you have if you need, would need to do all to all uh, interaction calculation. What you do in GOMAX is slightly different, that we're not doing those uh, checks for distance cutoffs based on single atoms, but we're doing them based on clusters of atoms. So we're also using, depending on what kind of computer hardware we're running on, different sizes of clusters to define how many atoms should always be checked against each other. And we're also not just using a single distance to see which atoms might be interacting in the future for the, uh, for the buffering. But we have also a second outer buffer that makes it possible makes it possible for us to on the fly update the inner pair list that uh, you are interested in for calculating interactions with. <coughs> During downtime, for example, on an accelerator device. Now this sound may sound a bit strange because we, it looks like we are doing extra calculation. But it means that we can increase the time between updating the uh, complete palace where we check again for all to all atoms, which atoms they may be interacting with. And this can save a lot of perform performance by only doing this every, for example, 100 steps instead of doing it every 10 steps. This has been a feature since Comics 2018, and it has led to actually some really nice performance improvements because you can, the, uh, again, uh, reduce the time between the uh, palace regeneration. I think why we are using those clusters of atoms because they are working very, very well with the way modern computers are actually using uh, special instruction units called SIMD units. SIMD units allow you to do single instructions on multiple sets of data. That's what SIMD stands for. 
but you need to load full instruction units and you can only as I can do one instruction on it and that's it. Now if you would load it with just two sets of data, two atoms interacting with each other, you would be wasting a lot of performance because you're not using most of the uh, register space that you have in your CPU. But if you use clusters of atoms, you can combine them together. And then for each atom, for each cluster, do the instructions with all the other atoms that may be interacting with it and that fit into the single unit. And what you can see here is that you can do a full interaction, you can do the cal calculated interaction, interactions between 16 atoms, but would normally use 16 interactions if you would do the uh, 16 cycles, if you would do this um, one by one. This cluster setup also works very well with the way um, uh, graphics card and graphical computing um, engines are set up because they can take advantage of similar uh, data layout. So we can use a data layout that is very close, very similar between the CPU kernels and the CUDA and OpenCL kernels for GPUs. Do the same thing, meaning that we are saving on code complexity and making it easier to test our code because it uses the same layout in the end. One major advantage of this is that we're actually not wasting many CPU cycles while running because we don't need to load data that often into the unit. We can always use data multiple times. And this allows us to reach actually 50% of what you would normally have as floating point peak performance on the CPU with our kernels, what gives us amazing speed, speed ups for even for CPU only simulations. But nowadays people don't run on CPU only anymore, they want to run on graphics cards. And this makes the whole setup way more complicated. Because a single MD step suddenly looks like this. We have on the CPU things like domain decomposition calculation, where we do the pair search and uh, divide atoms into different domains. You have bonded force calculation, you have PME force calculation. And then on the, P on the GPU, you want to do your non-bonded uh, force calculations. This can be even more complicated if you want to move in data from remote ranks, for example, over MPI. But uh, it's an additional complication that we don't really need to get into detail here. Now, as you can see, in this point, you have a lot of communication steps between the CPU and your device, in this case, a CUDA GPU. And you're still seeing that there's some time on the CUDA GPU that is wasted, shown by the uh, red stripe boxes, that the GPU is idle because the uh, CPU is calculation, calculating something and preparing the data. This idle time can of course be reduced if you would start offloading more things to the GPU. For example, the uh, PME uh, mesh calculation can also, force calculation can also be moved to the GPU. And then depending on the performance of the GPU compared to the CPU, it can, it can mean that you waste a lot less time between if in this step where either CPU or GPU are idle. But even this is not always perfect. You can test and see if, if you run Gormax with uh, the uh, necessary flags to see how many idle cycles you have. It can be that in this case, it's either your CPU is still idle because it's waiting for the GPU if you have a GPU. Or your, CPU, or, or your GPU needs to wait for the uh, CPU to calculate the bonded forces, do the integration and constraints before it can get new data. To uh, get around this idle time, we actually worked a lot for GOMAX 2020 to make sure that you can actually do the whole ND step on the GPU. It means you offload PME force calculation, you offload non bonded force calculation, you offload bonded force calculation, and the integration of forces and constraints onto the GPU and make use of the uh, acceleration features there. This can lead to very good speed ups if you have weak CPUs that are, that are much slower than your GPU and can mean that you can run multiple simulations on a single node where you have multiple GPUs and you can run an extra simulation on the CPU because it's mostly idle. But this can also be a problem because it's not always the case that you can calculate really everything on the GPU because we don't always have kernels to calculate everything on the GPU. One very erroneous 
uh, example there are the charm special forces where we need to calculate forces from C map terms and there is no GPU kernel for this. To do the calculation then, we need to be able to copy force positions back from the CPU, from the GPU, excuse me, to the CPU. So we're basically offloading to the CPU, calculate our special forces, and then copy them back before we do the integration on the GPU. This can actually lead to improved performance if you, for example, would decide to offload bonded or PME calculations from the GPU back to the CPU. Mm. but do the update and constraining still on the GPU because in the uh, above scheme, you see your, your CPU is suddenly idle. It's not doing anything for you. So why should you waste those cycles if you're not, not planning to uh, use them for something else? This means that if you do uh, everything on the GPU, you can actually be slower instead of offloading to the CPU. And we are working on automating this as much as possible so that Gormax will be able to tell you which offload uh, is the uh, optimum one for all your current simulation settings. And we are also trying to improve the um, simulation, different simulation types that are supported by run, for running everything, all the calculations on the GPU. This is still some ongoing work because even in Gormax 2020, you cannot use this with domain decomposition and multiple ranks. If you're not willing to be a bit um, experimental and try the uh, uh, experimental feature flags that are in the code for this, so you can try it out. And I would recommend if, you're, if you really want to check this, that you check out the uh, blog post by NVIDIA, where they're going into detail how to run the simulations, how to enable the developer or experimental features and how to validate that these simulations are still stable and doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I think this is enough for talking about how we achieve speed. Our speed ups now talking about what you can actually do with it. One thing that got added in Gormax 2018 and I think is one of the most important things that got added recently, the ability to validate physically correctness of simulation settings. This is both uh, something for us as developers to make sure if we change something in the implementation of, for example, an integrator or a thermostat, that we are not um, uh, doing some unintended changes that suddenly mean your simulations are no longer physical. And it's also for you to check if your simulation input is actually following some physical laws and reproducing some observables that can be checked. With COMEX 2018, we ship a um, uh, physical validation suit. It can be run together with the um, normal regression tests, but it's usually not run because it can take quite a lot of time. As it also includes the ability for you, the user, to add your own simulations to it to quickly validate if they are valid. Validate that they are valid. Here is an example of a simulation that uses an unphysical um, setting in the, MD in the MDP input file and one that is valid and follows the physical laws. On the left, you can see actually the kinetic energy distribution if plotted against the expected value, uh, plotted against the temperature, temperature I'm sorry, uh, in form of KVT. And it shows that for using the parents and thermostats, the uh, expected values shown by the blue samples and the red filled line is far off from the uh, theoretical value shown by the black line. And it just shows you what I hope everybody by this point knows that Berenson is a thermostat nobody should use for actually uh, long time scale simulations. The right, you see the same simulation, but with the VV scale thermostat instead of Berenson. And as I hope you can see, or can see, we uh, fit to the um, plotted data, to the sample data, and the uh, theoretical value perfectly overlap, showing, yeah, the v scale in Gormax actually is a physical um, uh, thermostat. This is also available for a few other things that you can check, like Virostar, like Virostats. And it's a good tool for you try, if you're trying to sell see if your simulation actually will be able to give you physical results or not. 
Another thing that got added actually in Gomax 2020, so in the newest release, is the ability to run sim normal sim simulations of a protein or nervous structures and then fit them to electron density maps that are provided for, that are experimentally gathered. This means you are able to take an experimental electron density map from X-ray crystallography or cryo, cryo um, imaging. Put it to Gromax, give your structure to Gromax, and tell Gromax, please fit my structure into this map as good as possible. And Gromax will just do this. It will cal calculate a uh, force from the difference between the uh, map your structure, your protein, would create to the uh, experimental map. And then those forces will be slowly adapted to improve the fitting of the structure until it fits, or it doesn't fit and the simulation will stop because of that. This is rather cool because you can not just test if, for example, an X-ray structure would fit into a cryo-EM structure and how much changes are needed. You can also try to change structures between different cryo-EM den cryo densities or X-ray densities to see what changes need to be done to, for example, open a structure or close it and with physically correct forces, so nothing unphysical during the simulation. For the end result looks, it's, I just have this slide here because I think it looks really cool, is you have your density, you have your protein, and they match perfectly if your protein can actually fit into the density. What is uh, something I just, I cannot, can't stop being amazed. This has been the work of Chris Winkler that has been working on this for a long time as part of the Gromax development team. And I want to give him a big shout out for actually implementing this into the latest version. Another thing that has been uh, included in Gromax with the 2019 release is the ability to actually do QMMM simulation with Gromax, something we have been sorely lacking in the past because it has not been able to do this reliable with the legacy QMMM interface that we're having. Of course, you can uh, just link Gromax to the CPMD program. And then uh, through CPMD control, what will actually happen with your simulation and try to simulate excitation states of atoms, chemical reactions in a protein environment, whatever you want. There has to be a word of warning here, actually, that this um, uh, is under a major rework, actually, right now for Gromax 2021. Because we realized that the, this interface still relied on some of the old data structures and simulation types that were long deprecated. So we're moving to changing this to a different interface at the moment. We'll see if I have time, I will talk about this a bit at the end of the lecture when I come to the future of Gromax. Another thing that has been added in 2018, and again, I think not that many people are aware of this, that we have a very, uh, not just great, but awesome way to do enhanced sampling in Gromax with the adaptive rate histogram map that now. It is quite simply, uh, as the slide says, you have an iterative scheme that solves for the free energy or bias that you're interested in. By collecting samples during the MD, and not just from a sim single simulation, but you can, uh, can have multiple simulations as well. And using those samples continuously to update the free energy estimate, until the difference between the target simulation and your actually collect, collected, um, actually calculated um, bias that you have collected from your samples becomes zero. In practice, this looks like you have here on the, on the right side that you have a flat distribution before and you have the target simulation. Now, if you start, you see can have multiple workers that are continuously updating your free energy surface until it converges to a point that is as close as you can estimate for the uh, final distribution. And this was without any information about what is actually the target distribution here. Now, one major advantage of using this in Gromax is that it works very well with our domain decomposition code and also the ability to run multiple simulations at a time. Because you can run the, the plot issues up to 100 simulations on more thousands of cores and reduce the time that you actually need until you get your 
an energy calculate that you until you get your energy that you're interested in from hundreds of hours to maybe a few hours because this scales amazingly well the simulations are independent but they can update the bias you're looking for, for independently in the simulation communicate every hundred steps or whatever steps you set and with this communication continue updating their, their bias and not they won't stop until they actually converge to the final data um, value that you're interested in. This work has been done mostly by Bill Hess and Rebecca Lindell. And there are some very interesting papers on this if you're interested in, for example, for calculating the energy of bases flipping out of double stranded DNA. DNA that was one of the um, key uh, early examples of using this. Another thing that has been included recently as beginning in 2019 and now has been extended in GOMAX 2020 is the Python API that by now allows you to fully control a simulation from Python. You can set up simulations, you can run simulations, you can analyze simulations, you can build up dependency graphs that get automatically resolved by the API workflow mechanics. You will again set up a simulation, run it, modify it, and then analyze the data from it. You can also use the API to uh, you know, define uh, additional restraints that you want to put on a simulation, making it uh, hopefully much easier to work with Gromax in uh, different environments. If you're interested in a more in-depth view into this, I really uh, recommend you checking out the webinar where Eric Ergang talks about what you actually can do with GMAX API. And I would also recommend you checking out the excellent paper that he has written with Peter Kasson on this. Now, enough of what we have in GRAMAX, and it's time to actually think about what is the future. You can always, of course, check on GitLab, where we have developed now what are our current milestones. You see when we are planning to release new versions, what are current issues that are assigned to versions and check out if there's something that you're interested in. You can also, of course, open new issues if you think something is wrong with Gromax or you want to inform us about an awesome new way that um, we can do MD. Of course, I would recommend then that you get in touch with the developers um, more closely so we can discuss what are good plans for a future or if it's better to have it as a standalone development somewhere else. What you can also see there is our current development branches, the current stable branches and the state. And what we're currently working on, we have merge, merge requests and code that is about to get into Gromax. So if you're more on the development side or want to contribute, I highly recommend you checking it out and maybe start contributing to our project. Now, I also have to show what is the current timelines if you don't want to go through GitLab yourself and figure out when we're planning to release things. The um, plan is for the 2020 version that we're going to have at least three or four more patch releases until the beginning of next year, where we are going to continuously fix the issues that are brought up with the code. I don't think there's going to be more releases for the 2019 version because it's currently in a stable development in a stable phase where we would only fix issues with the physics of the simulations in it and luckily none have come up so far. For 2021, I am expecting to open the beta phase at the beginning of September this year. This will also then mark the time where no more new features are hopefully included into Gromax, but are targeted again then for next year's, the following year's release. And we will use the time instead to polishing up the existing features and making sure that we have uh, well-working beta and release candidates that then will result in a new GOMAX 2021 version at the beginning of next year. This may not be as this year's version we release directly on January 1st, but we will likely want to have a bit more time for people testing out the release candidates. So this will be at the, probably at the mid of January instead. Now, what are we currently working on? One thing is something you may not be aware of and maybe you don't need to be aware of, and that is reworking how 
we are performing the integration step in the simulation. The simulation step is relatively simple if you think about what needs to be done, but it needs to be done in the correct order and with the correct uh, frequency of the different steps. This is usually be achieved by just having a single uh, loop function that loops over the steps. But this is not modular. You cannot easily extend um, a simulation loop if you want to include a new simulation kind. You need to duplicate a lot of code. And you cannot um, decide to maybe go back a step if you have did, did want to implement something like uh, Monte Carlo, a hybrid Monte Carlo molecular dynamics. Now, what we have been working on for 2020 and continuing for 2021 is modularizing this, that we define the different things that need to happen during an ND simulation as individual modules that can be com combined together as we want, as long as we end up with a fully functional simulation in the end. And if you've been running 2020 and used Velocity Relay and you didn't notice any difference to 2019, then everything works well because we have enabled this already for those kinds of simulations and are looking forward to replacing our current legacy code paths for this also in 2021. Hopefully again without any of you noticing because it means that we did everything right and nothing got broken in the way. Another thing that this modular um, integration will enable us as soon as it's implemented is actually an easy way to do multiple time stepping. So in this kind of simulation, you don't use the same time step for evaluating all forces. You use different time steps for, for example, the fastly um, oscillating forces like bonded forces, and longer time steps for forces that don't change that much over time, for example, the non-bonded um, interactions. Now, uh, this makes it possible to actually uh, a, increase the total time steps even though the five femtoseconds I show here for non bonded um, time steps is slightly optimistic. It also means that you no longer need to use virtual sites or constraints for bonds. Virtual sites and constraints work very well for fixing the distances between atoms, but they're not physical. Atoms oscillate, the distance between them are not fixed. But you want to, don't want to have small time steps for a simulation because then it takes forever to sample enough and you instead want to have the long time steps and then take in the, the uh, trade off by using constraints or virtual, virtual sites for that. What you could time stepping, you don't need to do this anymore. Another advantage is that the bonus force evaluation is usually a small part of the total cost of uh, force evaluation for a single ND step. So you can pay this cost and do multiple time stepping here, in this case, 10 times for every non bonded time step and still have the same performance as before, if you have a good um, general integration scheme. So this will allow us to hopefully enable longer time steps by default for users and make it possible so, to get rid of constraints where they are not needed. Again, we're hoping to get this into 2021, likely enabled by default. And if nobody of you notices anything good with the simulation, then again, we did everything. Right. Another thing that has been worked on uh, a lot now for the 2021 release is that we are trying to get as much acceleration done for free energy calculations as possible. This is done uh, mostly by Magnus Lundberg, that is a contributing developer to Gromax. And he has been working hard on first getting uh, GPU support for the multiple PME grids you have in free energy calculations. So you will finally be able to accelerate free energy calculations on GPUs. And also support introducing SIMD support for the free energy kernels so that they can also take advantage of our very efficient SIMD um, that we have for our kernels, which means that they, those interactions are no longer the bottleneck in the calculation if you want to do a free energy simulations. Uh, we also hope to get some general speed up by um, our code modernization and optimizations, but those are the major things that we're trying to integrate into 2021. We hope they will be noticeable from the beginning if you're planning to use free energy simulations at all. Another thing to speed up 
the general simulations, especially if you have very large uh, simulation boxes and maybe sparse systems, is that we want to be able to imp implement a fast multiple method to su supplement our current PME implementation. As you might be aware, if you want to do a PME on a simulation box, you need to at some point communicate between all ranks or the grid position to calculate the PME mesh. This can be inefficient, so we are already doing optimization there to split between smaller number of PME ranks and particle ranks with less communication steps. But it's still not optimal because 3D, the 3D FATs that we're using can still be limited, have limited scaling. I want to use in that is the fast multiple method where we do um, evaluation of the uh, electric fields to calculate long range electrostatics on, on different cell sizes. And just in terms of computational cost, this is much better than uh, PME, much better scaling. But the reason why it's not usually used and not implemented yet is that the uh, prefactor is much larger, so the uh, uh, computational cost can be higher than PME for smaller systems. We hope to get this implemented in 2021 or following version. And then it will likely be able to speed up simulations of boxes that are very large and of sparse particles. Because if you have an empty uh, space in a um, simulation that uses PME, you still need to calculate the PME grid for that space. For an FMM method, you don't. So you can save a lot of time there. This uh, same as the multiple time stepping, this has been most of the work of Burkes. And he is working on improving, getting this in as soon as possible. Something else we have been working on, and mostly I have been working on for almost the past two years is improving the way we do data analysis, doing the way to how we enable data an analysis steps for users. I think all of you know what is currently the way to analyze a simulation. You take your trajectory file, you run it three times to TRJConf, and then you hope you have the right um, uh, position of your protein that you're analyzing to actually run RMSD calculations, RMSF calculations, distance calculations, whatever you're interested in. That shouldn't be needed. Because in the end, a tool will know how a um, structure of molecule that you're interested in analyzing should be oriented in a box before it does the analysis. An RMS analysis tool knows and needs the protein in the box, no jumps between different images, and all the atoms are whole. Easily done. This can be expressed in a programmatic way. And then you can pre-process your trajectory file to make sure that those preconditions are fulfilled before you do the actual analysis. I've been working on implementing those um, requirements and the pre-processing to the pre trajectory pre-processing. The hope that some part of this will make it already into 2021 and be enabled for a small number of tools to make sure that people can use this instead and having to run TRJ conf manually all the time. Another thing that we are working on in the background and mostly for our own sakes, but also to make it easier to people implementing new methods, trying out new things with Chromex, that we want to modularize how we express different methods that are run during MD so that people can just add a new module instead of trying to hack legacy code to introduce a new simulation step in the middle of the main MD loop. This is uh, done mostly by Christian Plow that has also implemented the uh, density fitting code. And we are aiming here to both make it possible to check the validity of different simulation methods, the extensibility for making it easy for implementing new things and not too difficult, also making it possible that you have API level access to those routines to make it, to make you to enable you to from from the outside declare a new method, link it into main Gromax and run a simulation with it. On a similar note, we are working on doing 
almost the same thing with the non bonded calculations. But here we are striving to create a library of um, uh, uh, methods that enable you to do accelerated non bonded calculations for sets of particles with preconditions how those particles interact. Just give to the library for the different API uh, routines and you, get, you were getting a force calculated for those atoms back. And then you can do whatever you want with those uh, forces. You can use them in your own uh, simulation engine to do the integration for the next step. You can try to um, do um, uh, strange ways to integrate fo forces in different ways. And maybe even replace the current force calculations that you have in your method with those library calls instead of having to implement and check that you did the implementation right for yourself. In Gormax, we want to use this to replace the legacy code that we're having. And we're hoping that it's possible if we can expose those uh, routines at the API level, make it easily extensible for people that want to play around with different force calcul calculating schemes. In the end. Another thing that will hopefully make it make sure that in the future when you get the Gromax version you can be sure that it's fully tested and all the possible ways we can think of have been tested automatically without any interactions need, needed that we're working on containerized testing and distribution using Kubernetes and GitLab. We have different um, build tools and test tools images done with Docker that are then used in a Kubernetes cluster to make build nodes that build Gromax for us and test nodes that test the code on different hardware with different accelerator devices or without and different uh, libra libraries available to get a verdict if a new patch that we want to merge into the code is ready to be merged or not. We are also planning to use this to actually distribute um, Docker images to users that use the same pipeline here to uh, build, an, uh, build a version of Gromax inside the Docker image that you can then use directly on a supercomputing cluster with Singularity. And the um, hardware acceler acceleration that you need without you having to worry if that your installation may be compiled differently differently that you get issues with doing one time with different processes that you're running on, but that the um, Docker image takes care of this for you. Of course, those are not all the plans. And I am seeing that I'm already running out of time. So yeah, there are a lot of other things we're working on that are hopefully coming to fruition, maybe for 2021 or later. And I welcome you to checking out current development again on GitLab. Also, you can check out how to contribute to Gromax if you are interested in doing so. And looking at the webinar I'm, I made for this a while ago, I have to warn that it's not totally up to date because it was still targeted at our old um, code review and testing system. But most of the things will still be there. And I also would like to thank all the people that have been working and are still working on Gromax. And especially you that make uh, our time on developing Gromax worthwhile.